to another episode of Gymnasticsville. I'm your host, Midnight Robin, and we have a great show today. Carrie Adderley, the action figure, is in the building. What's up, Carrie? What's up, what's up? And we have Taki Abdullah Simmons, assistant coach for University of Oklahoma men's gymnastics team. How you doing, Taki? Yo, yo. I'm all right. All right, guys, we're going to get the discussion going today. Uh, Still gymnastics in nature, but a different field. I want to talk a little bit about, first of all, did you guys see Black Panther, uh, the newest Marvel movie that came out, and what were your thoughts on that? Carrie or Taki, either one of you guys. Carrie? All right. Uh, I thought it was great. You know, I saw it with my family and... uh, uh, definitely hit home in a lot of different areas in that movie from both of the characters or both of the main characters and um nah I thought it was great I thought the villains were great I thought the the stunt choreography was great I thought the uh CGI was great you know I thought everything that they did to the movie that they do with other movies that enhances it so well makes them look so good I thought that I'm glad they took that same special care to make this movie uh so special for so many people. So great movie. You know, if you haven't seen it, obviously go out and see it. Yeah, I mean, Talk, what are you what are your thoughts on Black Panther? Um, no, I liked it a lot. Um, I saw the movie probably a week after it came out, so I was hearing all the buzz and everything and people are calling it like, you know, just an all time great movie. So I kind of wanted to go into the movie and not have a jaded perspective because I'm like a movie buff. So as, as 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 proud and as happy as I was that it was like the first time that it was, you know, a black director or the first, you know, black Marvel superhero and all that great stuff, which is obviously great, uh, groundbreaking stuff. I wanted to at least go into it with that open mindset to just view it and watch it as a movie and not just look at it as giving it two thumbs up even if I didn't think it wasn't that great but I still walked out of the movie saying it was a great movie um, I, I love the direction in which it went I love some of the topics in which that they brought up in the movie um, so overall I was just I was really happy to see the movie and then throughout after having you know just knowing all the, the background of like like I just said before about it being the first uh, African American superhero movie and the first time that they had a African American director directed. I was just really, really, you know, I got choked up at moments before the movie started because that's just a really great thing in, in cinema to have those accomplishments now. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited. Yep. About and, the then, excited and then right Jordan, uh, but, yeah. I mean, uh, but I, you know, to be honest, I really want to see the director's cut. I hear it's like a four hour movie because I could tell that there were some things that were chopped up and left out because, you know, I'm sure the director had a vision that was probably way more than what we saw, obviously, because the director's cut's like four hours. I would love to see that at some point, but um, either way, it was a really great movie, and I'm happy that they took the time to develop the, develop kind of like the that background story that they have for the, for Black Panther and Wakanda. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I'm when I think think about Black Panther, yeah, I think I agree with all you guys. It was a great movie. Um, but it's great that a lot of people thought that. I mean, when I'm looking at some of the sales, I mean, the February box office hits an all-time record of $1 billion. And most of that was fueled by Black Panther. So that tells me that if these movies people are coming out and spending their money, then most likely we're going to see another Black Panther, which is great. Because you're right. I mean, it was a great storyline. Um now I want to shift focus more into the to the stunt aspect of the movie because we actually had a uh, former gymnast Chad Crumley was actually one of the stunt guys in that film, and um, I just want to talk about this the stunt business in general and that transition from gymnast 
to you know to to stump performer and you know over the last few years you know I had an opportunity you know to really watch you know Chad you know transition into stunts into major motion films you know he was Jimmy's at Oklahoma then went out you know did uh Disney the the festival in Lion King if I'm not mistaken he still works there and then in the meantime is when he started developing some of his uh other acrobatic skills, you know, like the stunts and, and head takes and all that nature. What'd you guys think of Chad in the, in, in, in the film? I think he had like a good, good 20 seconds of FaceTime and that really cool, uh, that stunt part in the casino, right? I mean, what'd you guys think of Chad's performance? Well, Chad did a great job, you know, he, he, he's a big, he's a big guy, he's like an OC looking dude, so he looks like a great villain. Um, um, if you haven't seen the movie, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, hopefully this won't get away much, but he, I don't think he survives because, you know, he gets, he gets whipped pretty good. Um, but I think he did a great job and I'm happy to see Chad in these movies. Um, I think it's great for, you know, for a gymnast to be able to make that transition to the stunt world because everything that I've, I've heard of the stunt world is really great. It's a great team and it, it's nice to, to be able to utilize your gymnastic talents in other ways after you're done this sport. So I was really proud to see him in it. Hopefully one of these days he'll maybe get a line or two or able to uh, not only get whipped, but actually, you know, give a beat in this movie. But either way, he's getting his face out there. So it's great to see an OU alum and former NCAA just have that type of uh, uh, credit to its name. How about you, Carrie? Your thoughts on Chad's performance? Yeah. I thought it was great, man. Uh, the scene that he, the scene that he was in, you know, it was obviously it was, it was a brief scene, but it was a uh, really key scene in uh, in the whole movie. So uh, it was great to see him there. Um, I actually know uh, a dancer friend of my wife, uh, Zola, Zola Williams. Hello, if, if you're listening to this, uh, she was one of the female warriors, and. Black Panther as well. So it was actually cool to see two people uh, that I knew and recognized in that movie uh, or had been familiar with, you know. So it was, it's great, man. You know, obviously we know other guys that have been in a bunch of different movies. So, you know, this one in particular also for a uh, gymnast, uh, especially even a senior gymnast to be a part of it, it was great. Yeah, I mean, and so... As we're talking about the, the stunt industry, and I kind of want to talk about more like, you know, the stunt industry, but also, you know, the, the gymnasts, especially the ones that are kind of, you know, on that senior national team side. Uh, and I know, you know, for, for, for USA Gymnastics, there, there is an athlete representative. Um, I have some mixed views on how, how efficient or her you know, the athlete, you know, rep is for USA Gymnastics being that it's kind of a part of USA Gymnastics, that role. Um, how important do you think maybe getting uh, an athlete rep or talent management to start really being involved with the sport from an outside to help kind of just progress some of these guys in terms of uh, what they can do? Um in terms of, you know, how, how they're treated or how much money they're making or the work environment. I mean, do you think there's a need for more, you know, specific talent management within, within our, within our discipline, within our, within our field, acrobatics, gymnastics? Oh, um, well, I think one thing that just most gymnasts struggle with is um, kind of the transitional phase from gymnast to their career. Um, but also, it's just, just overall education, probably knowing what's out there that you can still accomplish with your gymnastics talents. So I definitely think there's like a uh, definite gap between that, that knowledge that these older athletes are getting from like the age of 18, 22, just knowing what, what they're possibly capable of doing before they maybe choose a second career or something like that. So I definitely think there probably needs to be some, someone, some organization out there that's 
helping these guys out because just generally they these guys don't get enough exposure one you know these guys to put in a lot of work and they make the national team or they're um but they really aren't being put out there enough to possibly make more money so so there definitely needs to be more avenues for these guys to benefit more from their gymnastics than they they have been so but again like you said the athlete rep is a part of usag so they're going to do everything that they kind of need to for just their gymnastics career. I don't really think USAG is necessarily looking at their totality of the athlete and what they really want to do with their life and beyond gymnastics and, you know, the NBA and NFL, like, like you said, their athletic organizations are separate. So these guys are getting more lessons about financial planning, about other ways of making money. And so there, there's more of that whole scope of, of bringing up the athlete and teaching them how to better themselves as individuals, not just a part of their their NFL system on how to be a good professional in the sport that they're in. So I definitely think there's something there for having an organization step up and be a part of uh, the overall growth of the person uh, and their careers for sure. How about you, Terry? Yeah. What you Excuse take? me for that last time. Yeah, I, I think it's important that these guys start seeing this or taking this a little bit more seriously because to me I think a lot of it was the the sale of, of the Olympic dream by USA Gymnastics. I feel like that part of the culture got I think just overhyped about how it really works for guys in the real world after they, they spend a lifetime in gymnastics. You know, these guys are spending 25 years training. Um, you know, 20 years even. You know, it just depends. Training in gymnastics um, and learning. And then all of a sudden, there's no, you know, there's no degree for it here. There's nothing like that. When you look at different countries, other places, people get a master's degree. If you learn and train, become a master of gymnastics practices and fields of education, you get the, you get a degree for that. You know, you get a, you know, it already goes into a good thing. Um, but here, it's not that it's not the case. You know, it's more of a novelty or kind of considered, uh, you know, a sport like, you know, it's not to say a country club sport, but that that kind of feel to where you know you gotta pay and it's expensive actually gymnastics is an expensive sport to do and then you train all these years and then after that there's no real professional level to earn uh, uh, a good living comfortably even if you're you know the 10th best guy or the 15th best guy uh, you can make a living doing you know what you love to do and you know it seems like that that's why stunts is that uh, avenue for a lot of guys, you know, to continue performing on that level um, and be able to get that same type of adrenaline rush that you get from performing high-level gymnastics. Um, so, you know, I just think it's important for all these guys to understand and, and actually band together and start considering this kind of avenue more, you know, uh, uh, understand that, hey, you know, the Olympics is great and, you know, understand the odds of it and work really hard for that goal, but also understand that there's there's options out there uh, yeah, well, sticking the around Olympics, in, in the sport. The Olympics won't give you financial security as a male gym in this country. Going won't, that's not enough. Like, maybe if you win a gold medal, you can possibly turn that into something that lasts longer than maybe a year or two down the road. But let's just be real. It, you know, no one should be thinking anymore that if I go to Olympics, that that'll set them up for their career. Um, yeah, it'll, it helps. It's great on the resume. It might get you a better coaching job. It might make you want to, you know, might make your, if you decide to open a gym, it might be something that helps drive people at the very beginning. But to be, if you're being frank, it's not like, you know, you're going to be on the women's side where you're going to get a lot of marketing and all this other stuff and, and endorsements after the fact. So people need to understand that if you're thinking about an Olympic and going to Olympics and maybe meddling being like something that's going to 
just catapult you to another level, that's really not realistic. So there really needs to be that mindset that, you know, you can actually get something more out of gymnastics if you don't accomplish those goals because there are plenty of people like, like Chad Crumley, you know, he's on the NCAA team. He, I don't think he's ever made it to this year national team, but obviously he's in movies now. So there's, there's legitimate work even if you don't make it to that level. So if you stay in the sport long enough to accomplish, accomplish something or just gather the skills, you're able to get a secondary career, Cirque, Disney, Star right. World. So there, there, there's plenty out there that you can accomplish without even going to the Olympics. And even if you go to the Olympics, there's no guarantee that that's going to be something that gives your secondary career that much more to it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah. Like, I know people are doing well, but... but that is, it's not like it is in other countries. It's not like it even is for women's gymnastics. So the men's community, you know, everyone needs to understand that you guys can push really hard in gymnastics, but you really, really always need to know that you have to have that. You need to have that career, career mindset always in there. I'm always telling the guys on the team, all right, what's next? What's next? You know, gymnastics. Having a career but, mindset and being able to get, put it back and pay it back into the sport because that's what hasn't happened in generations past. We've had guys going to great careers and things like that, but not really paying it forward back into the sport. Um, you know, some people become club owners and that happens, but I'd say on a larger scale, people just kind of drop gymnastics and they just become the same casual fan like everybody else. You know, versus when you look at basketball, football, tennis, golf, people are constantly engaged in it and constantly playing it on every level. And it's a community thing. It's fun because it's about the fun of it, of the sport. And so I think that part was lost in that kind of USA gymnastics propaganda of the Olympic dream. And, you know, it, it very, uh, it, it hurt it, you know, it definitely hurt uh, the mentality and psyche, you know? So now I feel like we're at a point that these guys are realizing that and it's starting to kind of turn around, you know? So, hopefully here in these years to come, especially during all this stuff that's happening in uh, USA Gymnastics, that it can be a whole kind of a inside out, you know, of positivity and helping these guys. Because the better the guys get, I mean, the girls are already great, you know. Um, I think we talked about this on the last podcast. You know, in order for our girls to have been great, our guys had to be great too, you know, in those uh, past generations. And even, you know, it just like on – competitive teams. Look at what's happened with the OU, you know, team and look at what's happened in, in different areas where you have good guy gymnasts, then the girl gymnasts become good because they see it even in practice. They see what the guys are doing and vice versa. The guys see what the girls are doing when they're practicing and how, you know, hard and determined that they're working. And it it, it raises the level. You know, we were talking at the well, we were talking about this on the podcast before about being up on a certain level and being able to bring everybody to that level. And then now you can go up to the, you know, every, take everybody even further, you know, into that. And so it's really, uh, I think right now it's still encouraging. Obviously we know what's going on again, but it's, it's encouraging that these guys are doing that and, and, and breaking the mold, you know? So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see in the um, next five years, how everything, everything goes. Yeah, and so I want to piggyback off of, you know, we're talking about the Olympic dream. And we posted uh, a few days ago a routine of, of, Jetty, of Jamie Natalie's high bar routine from the 2000 um, Olympic trials. And I want to ask you guys a question. I'm going to ask you to go first, Kerry, because you're a Buckeye. And Jamie Natalie in 2000, um, he won the NCAA All-Around Championship. Is Jamie Natalie uh, the all-time snub for not making an Olympic team? What do you think? Yeah, you know, it's definitely me coming up under him knowing, you know, in 2000 about Ohio State um, and just everything that happened, leading him leading into the Olympic trials. I mean, he, he, he hit every routine. He hit 12 for 12 at the competitions. 
or I mean, I forget how it was. The competition format was different back then. 24. 24 routines. 24 for 24. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't think you could have, I mean, you couldn't have done any better, and the guy was just lights out. And, yeah, I think he, he can't go down as that, you know. He, all, all my Buckeyes know, or at least you know, they probably have that same sentiment, especially the guys uh, that run that 2001 National Championship team with Jamie. You know, so, yeah, it was that was definitely probably one of the – a tough one for everybody and obviously tough for him. But, um, you know, things like that, you know, that happens in our – has happened in, on the men's side of gymnastics. And I, I don't know if that happens too much – on the women's side, but on the men's side, that's happened, you know, free, frequently. I don't want to say frequently, but it's too routine, like, for it to be happening, you know. To And when that happens, it, it just leaves a bitter taste in your mouth. And not even just that person, but even uh, the people around that person that, that's going through that experience. And, you know, that's that can turn guys off from the sport move on to a different sport or something different, you know, as we're seeing, you know, right now I'm in gymnastics, guys moving on, you know, in a positive way, but, you know, American Ninja Warrior, and two, some guys just don't even, you know, nothing with gymnastics at all, you know, so it's kind of, it's, it's sad when that happens, and yeah, I think it could be, there's a couple other ones, man, I don't know. <laughs> there's a, top, there's a top, what do you stuff. think, what do you think, Top? But, yeah, but he is up there. In the top. Well, you know that that was two thousand. So I was, so I was definitely in the mindset that yeah, I felt like he should have went. You know, during the time, you know, hitting those routines, and just I, I'm from the mindset that I always, I never like to hear when people use no experience as a reason to not use someone. You know, some of the greatest fittings are done by people that were, were young. That's why they're called prodigies. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. I don't think like that. I don't like that. And I think that was kind of what was said maybe during the time that, oh, well, he hadn't had the experience. I'm like, oh, whatever. He's hitting and beating the people that were that were out there. So I definitely was in the mindset that I felt like he just went. Um, he was very... Uh, um, you know, he, he was consistent, and he did, and he he earned his spot in my eyes. But one of the biggest snubs of all time, I don't know. You know, my my, you know, I'm a gymnastic historian, but I'm not sure that I know necessarily how things were done before the '90s that that well on some of those teams. Um, I know and on the men's side maybe, but I know Sean Townsend, 2004. I was there for that. Yeah, he he placed he placed he placed, he placed third. He placed third. He finished third. So Paul and Brett beat him, were, were first and second. But Sean Townsend was third, and he was skipped over. So he was third, and even Ty yeah. Thornton yeah. was fifth. Yeah. And he so, did all four spots, spot. four spots, yeah. right? Well, it's more, four it's more than that because he wasn't an alternate either. He wasn't, so, and neither was Ty Thornton. Yeah, you know, so so there's that one. Jamie Alley, I think, yeah. was six, you know, on the, or fifth or six on the seven man team, I think, or, or was that the beginning of the six man team? I can't remember. But either way, you know, like, like so, so people, have, people have been, you know, picked over, and for whatever reason, it happens. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to watch watch people. And I was training with Townsend at the time. So it was tough to see him come back and, and not be a part of the team. Um, and like Carrie was around for when Jamie got back and and him not being a part of the team. So it definitely, like Carrie said, it has a way of affecting everyone that's around you. But, you know. Yeah. That, that, they that, believe that, the same thing. They that believe that they should be on. You know, that's what happens. They believe that all the people around them even believe, like, yeah, they, they should be on this team. Like other people in the community, the parents, you know, everybody. And so when everybody sees it kind of in plain sight, aside from the score, knowing how the scoring is, it's like, well, yeah, this is what should be right. And 
that that has happened a few times in, in men's gymnastics and you know in pivotal years too you know i mean 2004 they want to go they want a bronze right no they want a silver in 2004. 2004 they got second they got S- second silver in 2004 yeah 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 you know i could have been gold <laughs> you know what i mean and that, that makes a difference it makes a well, difference. Look when the girls, when the girls won gold, it makes a difference. <laughs> you know, so, and then even when you got a gold medalist in Paul Hahn, you know, how do you? Well, you well, the thing about the thing about the thing about the thing I think that that made that sting. Well, well, for me watching that the two thousand with Jimmy and Allie not making that team was that. He was bumped by a three-time Olympian that turned into a four-time Olympian, you know? So my whole thinking is that, like... No, he turned into a three-time Olympian. That he was turned into a three-time Olympian, Olympian, you know, with that Olympics. And so I just feel, Taka, you touched on it, man. It's like, you know, I'm going to say it. Like, the men's NPC, a lot of them base their decisions off of international experience. But it's like... Jay Manali had just breezed through the NCAA circuit. And those gymnasts aren't, uh, let's say, they aren't bad gymnasts. I think it's very competitive in NCAA. The three-time Olympian John Roethlisberger came from an NCAA program. So that notion that some of these guys don't get picked on on these Olympic teams because of their lack of experience, especially when they come from an NCAA program, is, uh, is horseradish. You know what I mean? Like, it's... It doesn't make any sense, and, and I feel, you know, something the NPC is going to have to look at that whole not experience because you know who also got, didn't really get, you know, was was Yule. Yule and Akash, those guys, you know, were left off of the past Olympic team. They said he didn't have experience, but Yule had just won NCAA as a freshman. What do you mean he don't have the experience? And then when Yule got his experience at World Championships, he went out there and hit every routine. Place third on floor. So I have a problem with the NPC and people with that notion that lack of experience. I mean, come on. You know what lack of experience is when it's like your first time competing ever and you're at that stage. I mean, these guys have been competing through gymnastics for over 10 years against the best guys in the country. Okay? That's all I'm saying. So that notion definitely has, you know, we, we, we got to change that mindset and leaving people off the team that don't have that experience, you know. Um, do you think, uh, guys, do you think the MPC and some of these guys, you think they hold on to their veterans a little too long versus getting some new blood in there? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And I'm not going to call out anyone at this time, but just that whole notion of just holding on to some of these these national national team guys that are great in their own right, but do you think they hold on to them too long and not really given the, the talent that's coming up uh, enough opportunities? What do you think? It's not like they're holding on to them. You know, they right. still compete yeah. for these spots. They compete for these spots and they earn their spots. You know, now maybe, you know. Some of them are picked, though. Some of them are picked. Some of them are picked. Some of them aren't just earned. Some yeah. of them are chosen, okay? You know? Yeah, but, but rarely are they chosen and then not compete later and, and look like they deserved it. So that it, it, it's, you know... But I think that's the format that shouldn't be... That's the reason I think that it should be a more clear and transparent format to where if you compete on that day, just, you know, it's different for certain teams. Right, but well, this is an individual kind of based sport, so I think that if you compete on that day, kind of like snowboarding, on that day at the trial, you have to compete and make the team, you know, or on that day in that qualifier, you have to compete because if you don't compete, you don't get the opportunity to be on that competing injury or not. You just need to rehab and come back ready for next year. I that's how I think it should be. Well, you know, versus oh, he's injured, but he was on the team, but so we're going to put him on the team. I say, well, how about just he's off the team. Obviously, they have funding issues. There's a lot of different issues about that. So that's another reason why, because these guys couldn't even afford, you know, if they had a surgery, couldn't afford to not have that income coming in. 
you know? So I, there's a double-edged sword there that was created by that system. So that's why the system has to kind of be revamped completely um, and started anew. And if they do it, it, it would take all of one season or one whatever to get it to people to adjust because they change stuff all the time. So change this and make it the final kind of change uh, to for the rest of the generations. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I mean, here's my thing. All right, and well, let's bring up a, a scenario that just happened. Okay, I'm not sure if the Jim Masters Javale community knows, but the national team was shrinking. Okay, it it was shrunk. It was, if not mistaken, it was 15. Now it's down to 12. Okay, and the whole premise behind that was to pay the guys, the some of the top top guys, more money because of, of the budget. But my thinking with this is that okay, so you lower the national team to 12 spots from 15 and then don't get don't get me wrong i love Danell wittenberg and eddie panev okay olympic training center athletes that were on the world team but they're injured okay so we shrink the team and then we put two injured guys back on the team so i just feel like not that i have a problem with them being on the team but you know how for like the for the nfl or the nba or some of these other organizations, they have something that's called an IR, injured reserve. So, yeah, those guys still get paid because they were on national team, but they don't take they don't take up spots that healthy people can have. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it's like yeah, it's like we put them on the team like and they didn't even compete. Situations you get hurt at work, you know, workers' club, you don't get your full or certain places, you don't get your full check. Well, yeah, 75% of well, that, right? well, not yeah, even, not, e- that. not yeah, even that, but, but at least, but then someone else is able to come in and take that spot because now on the national team, if you get injured, right. And you really get like Danelle and Eddie, you get put back on that team. That's the 11th and 12th spot that, that is, that is reserved for injured guys. So my thinking is that if they're hurt and you want to put them on, you guys should create like a separate budget for injured national team members. But you still keep that number, that full number of healthy national team members. Like that 12 that's on national team, they should all be healthy. They should all be ready to go. I just feel like, I feel like injured guys shouldn't take up those spots. You know, there should be a separate budget for the guys that are injured that you want to put back on the team. I mean, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think, Talk? I think that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, it's got to, it's just, they just need some type of a form, yeah. Yeah, that's all. It's, 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 it's just, it just sucks because, you know, a lot of these guys, you know, for instance, talk, you know, you, you know, you guys, you know, Oklahoma was just coaching a guy, Alex Powerinsky, you know, he was just on national team. And, you know, they shrinked it to 12, put two injured guys on there. He was on the border, and now he retired. <laughs> he retired. Alex Powerinsky's done. Another great U.S. male gymnast that was on the that was on the that line of teetering of continuing to go, and now he's not training anymore. That's so, a, you know this is yeah. I look at that as a fan. It's a shame. Yeah, it's so it's a young shame. too, man. Twenty yeah. what? Twenty one. We st- and it's fine. I think he just that's what happens in gymnastics. Three, actually. Oh, th- twenty three. Okay. But that's what that's what's crazy in gymnastics. In gymnastics, it seems like a lot of the guys retire in their prime. You know, not like on their decline. <laughs> Only a few guys. Prime is that pretty. It's pretty relative, depending on how your body is. Yeah. Gymnasts are almost true. in their prime from eighteen to twenty-one, and generally, if they did college gymnastics, they're exiting their prime in as a senior. So, you know, and and and, and again, that's the cause of the sport and the difficulty that it is, is that these guys aren't able to. Most gymnasts aren't able to stay in the sport, especially if they don't have the funding to force themselves to do it without being paid. You know, obviously some of the great gymnasts are staying in longer, but that's because they're great gymnasts and they're making money. But for those people that are on the borderline, there's no reason for them to continue because one, there's no guarantee of funding, plus their bodies are beat up. So, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, guys, and that concludes today's show, Gymnastics Ville. You know, it was some great discussion. Hopefully, 
you know, we can continue this and try to get some type of reform for the national team uh, for sure because, you know, you know, when I look at it from a national team perspective, man, like the NBA basketball, you know, they're, they're, they're national. They got like 24 athletes, and I feel that that cultivates a nice a nice group of guys that can kind of stay in the sport, and that helps you keep that depthness what we have in our sport. And I don't know, maybe we'll form, we can, you know, make the national team bigger. I'm not really sure, but let's keep this discussion going. Kerry, uh, thanks for coming in. No problem. And uh, Taki, thanks for coming in. All right, Gymnastics-ville, I'm Midnight Robbins, signing off, the voice of acrobatics. We'll see you next time. When you have a passion for action, dancing, acrobatics, rather singing, you have the practice for the challenge you're bringing on yourself, because believe me, it's hard when your mind gives up, you got